Someone called me a procurement maven, which was nice. There's some matriarchy there. I like it. Um, I'm a mom, first and foremost. Um, I'm a farmer, secondary, and I'm a forager, third, even though sometimes, certain times of year, uh, those roles become sort of, you change hierarchy. Mom, number one, first, always, but between the farming and the foraging, it just depends on the season. Spring and fall, surprisingly, busiest times of the year. <laughs> We are just winding down and getting ready for winter aromatics. Um, local foraged mushrooms are pretty much over. It's the end of maitake season with the cold that we've had, even though we've still had plenty of rain, way too cold for local maitake. Um, we've had our first few frosts, so farming and growing is pretty much, you know, folks are putting in their cover crops and they're seeding their garlic and their, um, their allium for, for robust spring harvests. I would do a bunch of nettles and watercress every year, so I've seeded all of that. Um, and we're kind of getting ready to go into um, a little bit of a slower time of year into holiday season. So for the food world and the culinary world, you know, orders are really robust going into larger eating times of year. Um, but the harvests and fall harvests um, of things like chestnuts or hickory nuts, things that will really last throughout the winter, um, are things that I'm continually gathering and finishing up those harvests right now. Right now we're in my absolute favorite time of the year. One, because I love autumn. I always have. My birthday's in the autumn. I absolutely adore it. Um, wild persimmon is a fruit that I've given a lot of love and attention to in the past couple of years in the few orchards that I've been working in and really understanding it as a wild food. Um, it's something that if you do a lot of research, you can find pretty significant histories in terms of native cultures and indigenous peoples and the way that they used it. There are some other traditions for fermentations that are out there that you can do some history research into and really learn about how other folks used to use these. Um, but it's something that is a very beautiful, compact, um, sweet, sweet fruit. It's actually one of the, it's the last fruit to fully ripen. Um, it doesn't fully totally ripen until after, right around the hard frost time. And it's just something that I absolutely adore. Um, it's a fruit that isn't fully ripe and can't be gathered until it actually falls from the tree. It's not like um, the larger cultivated types of persimmon that you see in market. It's very small, it's very seed heavy, really no bigger than the size of a golf ball, maybe. Um, and it's not ripe until it falls, so gathering is labor intensive, but it's also a lot like a little Easter egg hunt. You're kind of scanning the ground in this beautiful orchard space and you're looking for these tiny little pumpkin type kind of golden orange orbs that are all over the place. Um, and I'm really just very enchanted by them, not only because of their taste and their flavor profile and what they offer, but the way in which they kind of end the season with this very distinct, you know, any farmer will tell you when we're under danger of hard frost, farmers are scrambling, pulling everything out, they're ripping up the sweet potatoes, they're finishing a whole lot of things they thought they maybe had another week for. Um, and this is one of those things that kind of bridges the unlocking of the seasons between sort of early fall and into later really colder November fall, where we really start to get the sense of like, okay, the leaves are really dropping now. The light is different and the landscape is starting to look bare, even though there's still some color, we're, we're definitely noticing that change. These most beautiful, brilliant, sweet, like honey pudding, cherimoya type little fruits are ready. And it's like they've taken that entire season of growing and all the summer pollination and they made it through this late summer, you know, hailstorms that didn't knock down 
too many of the blossoms, so they actually went to fruit. Um, they just, they totally enchant me. I absolutely love persimmon season. We're right in the height of it right now, and the few places where I work, um, gathering them. Um, some of them are permission from neighbors. I've got um, someone that I work with who has a small little orchard established, and in exchange for me caring for the trees once a, several times a year, I'm allowed to kind of gather and harvest from the, from the space. So yeah, wild persimmon, definitely at my absolute favorite, and it's awesome that you're here today kind of checking, them, checking some of them out. So I've always had a garden. I grew up in New Jersey. My dad's got quite a green thumb. Um, I remember following him around as a tiny kid, kind of, you know, stealing stuff from behind as he harvested things. Um, and when I became a mom and moved to the country, I was looking for a way to be a work-at-home mom. I wasn't ready to return to a career in Philadelphia. And so I um, kind of cobbled together um, the idea of a specialty farm where there are really you know rare berries or interesting edible flowers that you can bring into cultivation maybe they grow wild maybe they're abundant in certain certain types of the region but if you can bring them into cultivation doesn't that make harvesting a little bit easier for you especially if you're chasing around little ones and it kind of evolved from there i started a mushroom farm with my ex-husband um, he kept that and took the business one direction and when all the dust was settled I was um, really looking to from a business perspective you know diversify product line in one way um, in another way I was looking to really grow and expand my horizons in terms of what you can grow here in the zone where we live and what you can bring into cultivation from the wild Don't. And this idea came to me from a Kurt Vonnegut quote, which when I reference it, I should really know the full quote. He talks about in some writing somewhere about how we really don't have four seasons, we have six. And the philosophies behind it are really an understanding of the ways in which those, the ways in which the seasons kind of unlock from each other and how, um, there's sort of that bridge, you know, we'll get a really unseasonably warm day in the fall and people are like, what's going on, unstable climate, which is all very, very valid. But at the same time, it's not necessarily out of the ordinary to get a 72 degree day in mid-October, maybe early October. Um, so kind of the idea that um, my foraging especially can be so hyper seasonal sometimes that there are certain varieties of things that are available for a week and I've got a, I've got a little bit of a job sometimes to convey that to folks but I also you know have to help clients understand that well we had two weeks of rain or it got too hot too quickly so all of the apple blossoms are no longer closed they've bloomed and that's changed the entire flavor profile if you wanted red bud I would have recommended, as I urged, get it two weeks ago before we had that unseasonably warm spring day that everybody's, you know, happy to blow off work early and enjoy out in the park. But all the flowers are very different in taste and texture and, and that kind of a thing now. So I think, you know, talking about the weather can be one of one of the most banal icebreakers is you enter into an elevator with an unknown, you know, Occupant, he's like, how about this rain or how about that storm or what have you? Um, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think that folks make a direct connection to the ways in which it impacts not just food on a small scale and a small level. Any farmer you talk to from this year would just cry and complain about the epic amount of rain that we had. Absolutely, I had a lot of crop failure too. Um, but there really is an interconnectedness to the idea that it's something that we talk about in this very innocuous way in this kind of conversational reference to the weather. Um, it really does impact stuff almost on a weekly basis if you get very, very specific um, to certain regions. So. I think it's kind of the four we know. I mean, there's definitely no arguing. When it's February, it's very clearly winter. 
Um, but the way that people say, you know, March is in like a lion and out like a lamb. That's an unlocking to me where the beginning of the month was very much locked in. Something that we knew and understood to grab a hat and a coat versus I might get away with a t-shirt and a sweater later on at the end of the month. Um, and it, like I said, I don't have, um, maybe other cultures have, you know, nicer, more poetic names for them. Um, it's really just sort of those bridges between when we're kind of trending, like we're really phasing into late fall and getting into early winter, and that'll be in November. So November is traditionally considered a fall month, but at the same time, we're kind of trending in one direction, and everybody understands that from their circadian rhythm, and the time has just changed, so the light looks very different, and God, it's dark when I got home, and all of that kind of thing. Um, but I think because some of my foraging is so week by week sometimes and very weather related that there are these sort of micro seasons within a larger identifiable four season type model. Walking with the kids and I came across morels and it was the first time that I had ever found a real kind of established patch of them. And I thought to myself, I've got pretty robust orders going out the door at the end of the week on Friday. It's Wednesday. Let me get in touch with someone really quickly. I'll take a couple shots. I'll gather what I see. I'll get a rough weight on it. Um, and with morels, it's a pretty easy sell, especially when they're local and they're massive and gorgeous and you've kind of gathered them right at the right time. Um, and it kind of gave me a little bit of, you know, wind in my sails and encouragement to say, hey, as your kids get to be maybe a little bit older and they're in school and they're spending time with you know, hobbies of their own, you can maybe put a little more footwork into walking around in the woods and really sourcing certain things. So um, the social media community of foragers is really inspiring. It's easy to kind of make some online friends in your region um, and kind of share the knowledge base. There really aren't a whole lot of foragers out there who, while they may guard their spots and that sort of, of the foragers code, you don't really give those up. They're certainly more than happy to help identify things or um, share knowledge around you know, culinary um, uses of things and ways in which you should or shouldn't work with certain types of things. So I kind of just built it from there. I thought, hey, there's a ton of this. This is cool. This is inspiring. Um, what else is there? And it literally sometimes comes to me from I'll be taking the kids to school and there's a new purple wildflower that I didn't notice last spring. Oh, it's that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, wait, you can eat them? Awesome. Let's see what they taste like. Oh, wait, you can ferment them and they turn into a totally different flavor as a soda? Even cooler. Let's find somebody else who might be lit up and inspired by that. See what they want to do and playing around with it. And then sort of bring that into the fold. Okay, now that's in my knowledge base now. Okay, well, I know that, you know, black locust blossom in the spring is in the pea family and an extremely delicate but also extremely delicious type of edible flower and harvesting them is easy and they're absolutely literally just dripping out of the trees at certain times of year. Um, so it kind of built slowly, but there were absolutely a few things that I was walking, literally walking along in the woods after taking the kids to school um, to be like, oh, wow, wait a minute, what? There's more? Like, let's, let's, let's see. <laughs> There's a little bit I could say about foragers in Pennsylvania. I've uh, bumped baskets, let's say, with a few folks in the woods over the years that um, have all been lovely and delightful and supportive and encouraging, but very much, you know, this is my spot in upset. Um, having said that, Part of my experience there has also included the fact that while there are amazing, strong, passionate, knowledgeable female foragers all over the region and all over the world, and a lot of them I'm connected with, um, in Pennsylvania, especially where we are, it's a little bit of a boys club. And because of that, I've gotten a little bit of a vibe sometimes to say like, all right, lady, you know, move along, like this really isn't for you. And that's something that personality-wise would just 
bristle at immediately. But it's a delicate talk. You know, you're not picking fights in the woods, obviously. Um, and I certainly know how to handle myself. But at the same time, um, it's a little bit of a boys club in Pennsylvania. And I'm okay with that. Because my business is thriving. And honestly, and I've said this when I've had that conversation with folks who might not be so happy to have bumped into me, um, there is more than enough for all of us. The wild abundance is truly, truly everywhere. And if you're running your life and your, your philosophy from a scarcity, this is mine, not yours, get out of my sandbox kind of model, that's kind of what you're gonna get back. You know, I approach it from an abundance model of like there is really, truly, truly way more than enough for everyone. Not all like buddy, buddy can we share all the time, but I find that you know, I find it all the time. If I'm not worried that there's not, if I'm, if I'm walking in an abundance way, I will find more than enough of what I need. And it's not magic. It's just kind of how, how I, my philosophy on how the world works. It really is. And you know, I can frame it that way and think like, well, okay, I am, am I different because I'm doing this as a female or, um, Am I just part of the same type of outdoors type person who is really inspired by all of this, you know, all gender aside, gender being a construct anyway, it, you know. Um, but the folks that I've learned a lot from and the folks who have been really supportive and encouraging or even helpful to be like, hey, we're doing, we're working, you know, come on down to the ramp situation and, you know, if you want to help put in a couple hours, we can, we're happy to, like, help you get what you would like. Um, yeah, I've kind of, you know, seen it from all, seen it from a lot of different angles since I started this. And it's, some of it's been eye-opening. Um, and it certainly, you know, made me um, make sure that when I'm approaching certain, approaching certain things at certain times a year, that I always kind of enter the woods with safety first. I don't forage during, you know, the height of different hunting seasons. And I'm really, really aware of how to manage that. Um, and... Um, you know, I've never gotten myself kind of, you know, lost or turned around and um, just kind of make sure that um, you know your space and sort of, you know, know your directionality. Um, there's a little bit sort of kind of Girl Scouts relying on, you know, kind of some just primary skills for being an outdoors person. Um, and a lot of my other research can sometimes come from a lot of survivalist type food sources. So like we tried the rose hips today, not a huge winner, but absolutely something that you're in a survivalist situation, you know, you might benefit from having some knowledge of. Um, it's interesting. A lot of my research will take me into places where it's like, here's what the indigenous cultures did. Aren't all these things amazing? Here are all of the little bit rough on the edges, survivalist blogs, same information. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it's the same food. It's the same, it's we're all just people walking the land at, at you know different times. Sometimes it'll depend. I've got you know a whole stack of um, resource books that I rely on quite heavily. Um, it's a lot easier to use a foraging app to take a picture and put it up and check on it five minutes later, and you've got a positive ID from thirty people in the group and sort of like a discrepancy from two others, and then you can kind of. Google that and go a little bit further. It's all really self-taught. I don't have a you know cute little old Italian grandfather who's helping me ID porcini in the in the pine in the you know in the uh, spruce forests. But um, yeah, there's a lot of reliance on kind of the knowledge, the the larger picture knowledge share from local foragers of folks who I really trust and who I really admire. There are a few go-to um, friends who I call them friends at this point where you can message them any time of day or night and be like, hey, I'm pretty sure, you know, or tell me how you'd work with this or tell me how you'd, you know, what's really the better time of year to kind of gather or deal with this or how did that pine vinegar turn out and maybe that's something I would consider or things like that. So I have a lot of those conversations sometimes. Um, and then sometimes with other foragers, you know, you just kind of can look through their feed from this time last year and maybe the same thing is in there. So it's really easy to be like, hey, I'm pretty sure I saw a purple flower the last spring in so-and-so's feed. Let's go see if we can get an ID on that and then I'll kind of figure it out from there. So it's a little bit of
kind of sourcing from different reputable places. Um, and I put all of my um, the genus species names of everything, mushrooms that are cultivated or wild goods that are totally brought in and really obscure. Um, I will always put the, the identifying name of the variety on the invoice. Um, it's something that's important to me to convey to not only my clients, but to my insurance provider <laughs> and my ability to be sort of covered there to say like, I've done my due diligence and my research here to say these are safe. Yes, they're wild edibles and that makes my insurance guy pretty nervous sometimes, but there's absolutely nothing in what I do that wants to put anybody at risk. And I even have some folks who are really, really into pushing the wild boundaries sometimes and they'll look for things that I know, yes, they're edible, but they may not be able to be consumed with alcohol and therefore I won't sell them. I won't market them. Honey mushrooms are a type of a wild mushroom that you have to cook them. Sometimes you have to change the water um, based on how you cook them several times over to remove certain toxins. And then you can consume them safely. Do you really need to push those boundaries in your restaurant downtown? Maybe, maybe not. At the same time, do you really need to convey to your tasting menu diners that they can't have alcohol throughout the enjoyment of their meal? So there are things like that. There are some wild herbs and um, wildflowers out there that have medicinal components to them that I'm very aware of, even though I'm not a trained herbalist. And, you know, certain things that women who are pregnant or nursing should absolutely not be consuming, even in nascent small quantities, as it's sort of, you know, a finishing crust on a seared piece of fish or something like that. There are certain seeds, there are certain um, herbs and things like that that uh, I'll have folks, you know, ask me for, can you get wild carrot seed? And I'm like, I absolutely can. Queen Anne's lace grows absolutely everywhere, but it's an abortificant. If you have a pregnant diner come in, I wouldn't want to take on that responsibility. That's something to really, really um, be aware of. And I kind of share that knowledge too. As a business lady, it's hard to turn down business. I never want to do that. I always try to find a way to say yes to what people are looking for, but I certainly do also feel pretty beholden to making sure that we're doing it in a safe, in a safe way, obviously, um, and in a way that will enhance kind of the enjoyment of wild foods as opposed to some scandal or scare or something, some place that was really pushing the boundaries on, you know, yeah, we can consume this safely, um, but maybe that's something that's more for private dining than, <laughs> than on like a larger uh, stage. So. I don't think so. Um, I know other growers that will offer forage goods different times of the year, whether they're, it's a really robust list or just a few type of kind of select offerings. Um, I worked really hard to narrow down certain varieties of things that I know are wild but can be brought into cultivation and I've established them here at the farm. So am I farming them? Sort of. Are they still wild? Absolutely. I just made harvesting a little bit easier. I don't have to go 20 minutes all the way to the other side of the creek. I can kind of walk out to the backyard and deal with the elderberries or the elderflowers. Um, and, or also have, you know, what I've gathered from the wild and then so some chef wants an additional amount. So I've got a little bit of extra here at the farm that I can kind of round out those numbers with. Um, it does make for really hectic, uh, workload sometimes where I'm like, Oh, I've got all this, you know, planting and seeding or tilling or tending to do. And I need to stay in one place to do that. At the same time, I've got to clone myself <laughs> and go run around to get all of these other things from all of these other places. I kind of bring it all in at the end of the day and then at the end of the week, kind of meet minimums for orders and things like that. So it can be really hectic at certain times of the year. Um, I don't really pride one role over the other. I really love them both and I love seeing what I get from both of them. And I love that the kids are here and the kids kind of see uh, you know, mommy's got to go up to the garden. We call it the garden, even though it's a little larger than that. Um, I'll be outside for a little while or I'll be, you know, come on up with me. We'll get to take some, you know, fun stuff to do out there. Um, or, hey guys, I need you to be cool in the orchard, in the chestnut orchard today because I've got, you know, about 
20 minutes of work to do, which is usually about an hour. <laughs> so there's some expectation setting. Um, but, and they'll roll with it and they'll be, you know, understanding of like, hey, we're gonna go on a really cool adventure hike. And I'll make it fun for them along the way. Like I've taught them over the years. My little girl loves to gather violets with me in the very early spring when the lawn is like purple covered in violets. I've worked with um, a distillery this year and they did some experimentation with a, like a violette, creme de violette type of uh, liqueur, which turned out really well they were really happy with. They're like, can we get much, much, much more next year? And I was like, absolutely not. I like hand pick the most, I call them whisper weight because they're so light to even sell them by the ounce is like back breaking. <laughs> um, but she loves to gather them with me and she can't wait for the first one to bloom. And she, I let her kind of find the first one every year. She's like, mom, the violets are cool. Mom, they're here. And I have a rule with them. They know that they're not allowed to taste anything wild, they're not allowed to put anything in their mouth until they can come to me or another grown up and say the correct identification. I don't make them go scientific route, but you need to hold a flower in front of me and, and tell me what it is and have a positive ID. So they that's been rule number one since the very, very beginning, even before they were um, as old as they are now. That's a really good question. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> in the state of Pennsylvania, I know that in terms of licensing for farm goods and farm product, as long as they're being sold unpackaged, um, sort of like, you know, in a five pound open case, um, I don't need specific licenses to be able to do that. And I've considered the wild foods um, kind of co-opted into that same type of model. Um, it, when it comes to something that's really rare or really odd, um, maybe that's a question I need to kind of dive into a little bit further. At the same time, all of the other larger purveyors are selling nettles. So I feel pretty confident that I don't need any licensing or any special Kind of credential to be able to do that. There's some buzz in the community a couple years ago about take my foraging class and get certified and I feel confident enough in the research that I do and the way that I um, you know safety first in all aspects kind of approach that um, if there's ever ever been any type of a question about something, it doesn't kind of land on my list to say, you know, yeah, just because I found all of this and it looks interesting or smells delicious, there's, there's really no, um, it's just not really an option. I really um, uh, know for a fact that I work in full integrity um, and that yeah, I don't fully know the answer to the licensing kind of question. Um, but in terms of it not having been an issue thus far, it seem, seems to be in the clear. <laughs> it, the, one of the bigger things is either dealing with the weather. Um, you know, if I've got to go and get 50 pounds of crab apples and I need that by Friday and I know that it's going to take X amount of hours and I don't know where those hours are going to, what day they're going to fall, but we're going to have a hard frost on Tuesday. I've got to do it all Monday. So, um, it's one is dealing with the weather and then two is dealing with, you know, they're potentially, um, coming up a little bit short. Somebody wants, you know, a certain amount of something and like black trumpet season. We do beautiful, gorgeous, lush, delicious season for local black trumpets this year because we had so much rain. Every other farmer out there is crying in their sleep about the rain, and absolutely, I have plenty to cry about too. But at the same time, we had a banner, absolutely banner year for mushrooms this year because of how much rain we got. So, you know, black trumpet season can just not happen. It's a short season, it's two to three, maybe four weeks long um, in the summer and right around kind of the same time as chanterelle season. And if you, same thing with chanterelles and even morels. If you're not gonna get the rain, it's not gonna get the mushrooms to, to fruit properly. So, 
you know, it's that balance between soil temperatures being warm enough, between enough daylight on the right facing slope of certain areas at certain times of year. And then, you know, but it didn't rain. So season was really short and, or we had an early snow season was really short, you know, that kind of a thing. So, um, that's probably the bigger challenge. And like I say, you know, it is what it is and we all just kind of roll with it. And that's a nicer aspect to the banal conversation about the weather, right? It's like, oh yeah, we complained about the rain this year. We're probably gonna complain about the snow this year. But at the same time, we can really be excited about how awesome Chanterelle season was, right? We can kind of be like, banner year for these types of crops. And I mean, it was like a, a rainforest out there. I grew some tropical varieties of things that I had very little hope for being robust or even really getting off the ground. I grew weed aloche this year successfully, which is a corn fungus. Um, I grew a couple different tropical varieties of edible flowers that I was like, well, yeah, we'll see if we get anywhere with these. And I'm like just dripping in them. I just had tons of, you know, something that is this is it considered sort of a specialty thing you know like um hibiscus was really really productive and and uh really happy this year and that was really because we had a difficult growing season yeah peppers and tomatoes not so good with all that rain and all the pest issue and weed pressure it creates um but because i've carved out this space where what i grow and then what i gather is pretty unique I can play in this area where it's like, let's grow, see if we can grow Thai hibiscus here in Pennsylvania. Guess what? We did. Guess what? There's a lot of it. Guess what? Olga's making kombucha with it now. This is awesome. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So. A delivery person would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of help. My partner um, helps quite a lot, quite a lot. He'll help. Um, you know, swap out tractor attachments so that I can really get, you know, ahead of the weather sometimes or, um, you know, will help me uh, gather, you know, certain things if I'm like, oh, I'm really swimming in this and I can use an extra pair of hands. He's amazing. But it is my business and it's kind of my responsibility at the end of the day. Um, I could see it scaling in a way where I potentially eventually have customers in New York and D.C. Um, I think the Philadelphia market is amazing. And the clients and the friendships that I've made over the past couple years, I really, really value and treasure. Um, they kind of kept me going at certain times where I was like, what am I doing? I'm this, I'm the woman who sells tree bark out of her trunk. What is this business? What is this craziness? Like, just go get a straight job, Heather. This is, this is wild. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. This is wild. Like, I get to spend my time the way I want to. And I get to bring things to the table um, that are really just the raw goods to provide and put into more creative hands who kind of turn them into this, you know, delicacy or um, something that's really artful and really creative to the palate. And I get really inspired by being able to not only, you know, bring the raw goods to the table, bring them to chefs who want to play around and experiment and create amazing new varieties of things, but at the same time, kind of share the knowledge behind that. Like we saw just the branches and the leaves, but the autumn olive berries. That's something to me where I'm like, this is a huge invasive. People and permaculture folks struggle with this all the time. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, flavor benefit. There's a lot of culinary benefit. There's also actually some health benefit, even though I don't, I try to really steer away from those areas. Um, and they're easy to harvest and they're easy to find and now, 10 other people know more about them um, from having had this conversation within season and having, you know, uh, fermented a bunch and juiced a bunch and done a bunch of cool stuff with them. So I really get inspired by that aspect of it, that I'm not only um, encouraging folks to play around with something that they've maybe never seen or tasted before, but then at the same time, share that knowledge with not just the head chef who ordered it, but the sous chef who just started last week, who's like, wait, what? Who maybe does go hunting and was, can be walking along in the woods and then be like, yeah, I know what that is. And as soon as you know it, you kind of brought it in house and the knowledge of it, and maybe you've worked with it, so you've like understood it. Maybe you worked with it three seasons in a row and you realized, 
when we got the early frost, they were so much sweeter, or when we got them two weeks later, they were a little bit drier, that kind of a thing. Um, when folks start to understand what the truly, truly local harvest looks like outside of growing and farming and cultivation, um, that's something that they'll take with them and, and own that forever. Um, seasonality would be nice. And the folks that I work with absolutely do get it because we've been in conversation over it for a little bit longer period of time. Um, but I think as consumers of delicious food, we all have a tendency to want it all, all the time. I love bananas. I love coffee even more. <laughs> if I had to, I couldn't grow those things. I'd have to find an alternative source. Can we still get an awesome fruit sugar from certain fruits that we grow here in Pennsylvania? Absolutely. Can we extend that throughout all seasons? through preservation or fermentation. Absolutely. Can you grind up certain types of fruit seeds or certain types of roots? It tastes a lot like coffee. Absolutely. And isn't that an interesting thing to be able to offer from a culinary perspective? Do I wanna grind up chicory root to make my own coffee? Not necessarily. But can I dry chicory root and steep it for a tea for a type of food preparation absolutely and that would be really awesome to do so um what would i want chefs to know the most oh, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> start over psst, psst, buddy it's okay what would i want chefs to know the most um foraging doesn't happen overnight or in a vacuum sometimes i need a little bit of time to go and get what you need so get your orders in early <laughs> Um, and clean your portion of the harvest sooner rather than later because I don't love to have to turn around and say, I'm really sorry, but chestnuts are over. I don't have any more. Um, I'd like, you know, to make sure you get what you need and you get what you want and that, you know, I can benefit from um, the sale of that too because, you know, at the end of the day, it is a business and I do have a responsibility to my one and singular only shareholder, which is myself. <laughs> Mostly just the kids. <laughs> I'm Heather McVennies. I run a specialty farm and a foraging business called Food Hedge. And I'm a mom, a farmer, and a forager. All in one.